Welcome to the second of the lectures on Henry Dunbar, a very profitable sensation novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon, published in three volumes in 1864. In this part, in this lecture, through an initial return to the set of key terms that I introduced when discussing Edgar Allan Poe's murders in the Rue Morgue, we'll be asking what sensation is in that term, sensation novel, by investigating first what the novel itself says about the term. We'll then start to consider the implications of sensation. We still use the term, of course, when we think of the latest media sensation or a sensational story in the news. So even though we're focusing on material from the 1850s and 1860s, I think you'll find that the discussion is still profoundly applicable to our lives today. Here are the key terms again as we first saw them. Text, time, detection, archive, game and reader. And this is where we left them, enmeshed in something I called discourse after Michel Foucault, something which regulates how we can connect to these key terms. Discourse, as you remember, can be considered as a set of rules that determine what we think of as reality. There isn't just one set of rules, what may be interpreted according to art history as an exercise of extraordinary talent in the painting of pale skin tone, may be interpreted according to medicine as the signs of anemia, or perhaps to a detective as evidence of a crime. This means, though, that the detective has to choose the right discourse, the detective reader has to select the right archive to interpret the evidence correctly so that she or he can arrive at an understanding and perhaps identification of the crime. The detective has to identify and activate, as I say, the right archive of his or her knowledge in order to access the appropriate discourse. But what does this mean in terms and the colour scheme of Henry Dunbar? Well, remember that there isn't just one discourse or archive, and detective fiction often plays with us, offering us several possible discourses and archives through which to interpret the evidence. We as readers are left with a choice. For example, here's the passage when Henry Dunbar faints on meeting his daughter in London for the first time. Pause the video to read it and subsequent passages if you like, then press start again to move on when you have read the whole passage. But before you do, can I ask you to note the page number? Now, I usually don't give page numbers in these slides because while I'm recommending Anne-Marie Bella's excellent edition of Henry Dunbar, published by Victorian Secrets in 2010, I don't really know what edition you're reading. But in this case, I am giving the page numbers from Anne-Marie's edition, as the formal sequencing of the quotations is very important. We're given the evidence and then the interpretation of the evidence. Now, this seems a perfectly logical and common sense procedure. Think what would have happened if the reverse had occurred. Maybe the evidence would have been infected by the interpretation. Well, think about what happens in other passages in Henry Dunbar. But for the moment, just look at this one. Now, the scene is then, on the next page, interpreted, and it's interpreted in two conflicting ways. First of all, Laura Dunbar activates what we can call the discourses, the archive of the sentimental, something the mores of the time would have considered gender appropriate for such a well-brought-up young lady. She concludes that Henry Dunbar's 
silent emotion is evidence of unexpressed love, she can't imagine an alternative way to understand it. Or perhaps she doesn't want to, as it would be too painful, even dangerous for her. Arthur Lovell, however, interprets the same evidence much more suspiciously. He's a solicitor, we know that, and he'd attended the inquest of the murdered man, and his legal training is indirectly recalled by the recollection here of his attendance at the inquest. Note, too, the explicit repetition of his reaction. This is not the first time he's been suspicious of Henry Dunbar, we're told. And then look at that last paragraph on this uh, sl uh, slide here. Note carefully how Arthur dismisses Laura's interpretation. Now, the discourse of the sentimental is closely related to a particular version of Christianity, which treats all of us as sinners who are guilty, yet who may be redeemed. We're all sinners but capable of redemption. And we're all loved by God in this discourse. Love is therefore the default relationship, the divine relationship, the default and fundamental position from which we should interpret evidence in this discourse. It's perfectly correct, then, for Arthur to say there that heaven grant this may be love, but he then undermines this sentimental discourse by what seems a common-sense conclusion communicated in a series of plain monosyllables and a very simple rhythm. I think it's pretty clear whose interpretation we're meant to consider correct. The interesting thing, though, is that common sense, which is, after all, just another discourse, is allied to the law here. It's a solicitor here who comes to this common sense conclusion, not an artist or a musician or a poet. The commonsensical is on the side of the law. Discourse of common sense overlaps with the discourse of the law. Now, the opposition of the sentimental and the commonsensical, the legal, had already been set up for us by Braddon earlier in the chapter. Braddon is a mistress of form, whatever some uh, critics say. Chris Pittard, for example, in his review of Anne Marie's edition, points out some of the contradictions in the text. But even at the time of her writing, Braddon was acknowledged by many of her opponents as a brilliant plotter, completely in charge of her narrative and the games she plays with us. And Chris has to acknowledge that too. Now, read the words on the screen and, as usual, pause the video to do so if you need. The passage comes from just a few pages before the previous ones where Henry Dunbar faints and his faint is interpreted. Do you spot the collision of two discourses, the two discourses I've mentioned, in just one sentence? Braddon has set up this opposition for us already, before that later passage, silently, almost invisibly preparing us for the later and more serious battle of the discourses where they interpret evidence. Now, in saying a Braddon is a mistress of form, I'm also claiming that she's a mistress of time. Whether we consciously realize it or not, she sets up expectations for us in ways worthy of crafted poetry, dropping hints that will be picked up later by the narrator, so that when they emerge, when she wants us to notice them, they somehow seem entirely logical natural, inevitable, and that simply an effect of the subtle echoes and repetitions she plants throughout the text. Now, a few critics have noted how Braddon repeats the same phrases within a the text. They consider this a fault. Well, I don't. Rather, these repetitions help a reader 
but they also play with the reader. It's as if Braddon had entered into our minds, become us, anticipated our every move, guided our moves in the game of drafts. She paradoxically wins the game of detection. Yet, curiously, we feel we've got our money's worth. Now, what this means, how we can explain this feeling that we've got our money's worth, even though we've been defeated in the game of detection, is very complicated. But one of them involves sensation. Sensation means a lot of different things. But one of the key ones that I want to concentrate on here relates to our physical bodily reactions. And that's where I want to start. What, when we perceive that discourses conflict, in theory at least, we have a physical reaction to that conflict. Our bodies, not just our minds, should flinch at the confusion or the debate. This flinching, which might make us more or perhaps even less interested in what's going on, is key to the idea of the sensation novel in its detective guise. We want a single discourse to take charge, to be dominant. In theory, at least, the conflict makes us read on until we can plump for one discourse that will explain everything, or even better, where more than one discourse uh, come together in harmony to explain everything. I think at the end of this novel, perhaps it's the sentimental that triumphs. Well, perhaps we'll see. We'll see in a later session, but we might want to consider that. Now, what I'm saying here is very general and theoretical, derived from a close reading of a few selected passages of a text. There are other methods to find out what the sensational means, simpler ones. We can, of course, just try to find out how a term is used in a text. One of the easiest ways is to search for a term in an e-text. I've downloaded an e-text of Henry Dunbar, for example, and simply search for the word sensation in it. The word occurs several times. Let's see what the occurrences have in common, if anything, so that we can seek to distill core meanings of the term uh, and how the term is used in Braddon's novel. Don't forget to pause the video so that you can read the quotations that follow. The conversation that you can see on the screen in front of you takes place in Mrs. Austin's house, where Margaret has been giving music lessons to the 11-year-old granddaughter of Mrs. Austin, Elizabeth. Mrs. Austin's son, Clement, as you'll recall, has fallen in love with Margaret. And here we find Margaret, Clement and Mrs. Austin together engaged in a conversation one evening after the music lesson. Although it's never openly stated, we have to act as detective to deduce the motives. Mrs. Austin clearly thinks her son is boring Margaret. He's giving her a lecture on his favourite essay, which we'll recognise, if we know it as decidedly sexist and not the most exciting read, unless uh, you're interested in Carlyle, of course. Mrs. Austin accordingly interrupts trying to change the subject with something she thinks of general interest, news of a crime. Margaret replies with a rather conventional, respectable response, relying on the discursive assumption that women don't or shouldn't read newspapers. Well, she has to appear respectable, doesn't she? She's speaking to her employer. Mrs. Austin, though, is not having this. Everyone reads the papers, as far as she's concerned, irrespective of gender, especially when sensational crime is being reported. And from this, we understand that a sensation is a news event that everyone is supposed to know about, everyone is supposed to talk about, everyone is supposed to share, everyone should share a sensation. <laughs> 
everyone should be affected by these media created stories. We find this meaning again in another passage where sensation is added to leader. That is, a kind of article intended to set the priorities amongst the mass of the day's news. A leader was an article usually written by the editor of the newspaper or a specialist leader writer. It may be then that there are sensation editors as well, newspaper editors or even newspapers that specialize in sensational stories. And here is another use of the term. It's clearly related to the previous ones. Again, it's a new story that everyone is talking about. Now, this occurrence of the word is, of course, different in meaning, apparently, from the preceding. It means rather a physical feeling or perception resulting from something coming into contact with Mr. Carter's body. Sensation, indeed, is usually related to the sense of touch. That means that a sensation derives from something that touches us, something that's very close to us. Bear that in mind, especially for future talks, for it may be that the senses of the word sensation may not be entirely separate after all. Here they are together. First, there's the media sensation, the story that everyone has to read and is talking about because it's an unusual event, usually that seems to threaten us or our values. A murder of or by a millionaire, for example, when millionaires, so the text tells us, are supposedly incapable of murder. All a newspaper or a writer has to do is activate that feeling of threat and a sensational story results. In both the media-related sense and the medical or physiological corporeal senses of sensation, it's almost as if we readers or our bodies are treated like machines. Press the right button we react in a certain way. We lie on a plank and the sensation we receive is of, hard, is of hardness. Read a story about a murder and a millionaire and we immediately start talking to our neighbours about it. Do you think that's what we are? Are we such simple machines? Is perhaps the discourse underlying sensation a scientific one then, or rather a scientific one belonging to a certain kind of physics dominant in the 19th century. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Remember that in your physics classes in school. I won't explore this anymore here, but I want to leave that with you as something that we'll return to later in later lectures. The importance of bodily reactions in decoding and understanding is very clear in the illustration from the Illustrated London News from 1865. It depicts a scene from one of the stage versions of Henry Dunbar. I suspect you can guess what it is. We never see this scene in the novel. I'll comment more on the stage versions of Henry Dunbar later, but the important thing here is how clear it is that revelation, detection, has led to sudden bodily shocks for both characters. Both are clearly startled by their encounter. An encounter we recognize straight away involves identification of each other, or at least the revelation of some terrible piece of news, some sensational effect. Now, this kind of effect is precisely what sensation fiction wanted to create in us as readers. It wanted to grip us, hold us tight to itself, 
physically control our bodies rather than our cool, rational intellect. So does sensation bypass our brains? Well, that's often claimed, even now. We still find denunciations of sensational headlines and stories in the news. Graham Law's wide-ranging article in the excellent Cambridge Companion to Sensation Fiction, edited by Andrew Mangum, which came out in 2013, points out that sensation in relation to the media of the middle of the 19th century was much discussed in America before it was in Britain. And in America, it was much more approved of. He cites an often quoted sentence from uh, the pioneers of popular journalism called Gordon Bennett. That is, that sensational journalism is of the very highest order because it depicts passing events exactly as they impress themselves upon the masses of the people. So the answer to my question about whether sensation bypasses our brains seems a resounding no. Sensation journalism is simply a reflection of what happens and what we want. But let's read this extract a bit more closely to see what else it can tell us. As we see announced in the first sentence, the topic of the article is sensation itself. And then the piece goes on to discuss various categories of sensational news. The famous passage follows. What interests me here is the sentence before the famous one, where sensation in print seems to invade every aspect of print, so that not only does it, but does form perfectly match content, but also indeed what the content refers to. Sensation descriptions of the latest sensation done in the sensation style. Looks like there is only sensation. There's nothing else. We can also see, and this is the point often made about this article, that Britain is more suspicious of sensational news and sensation in general than the Americans. And finally, the latest sensation is revealed not as a world event, a diplomatic or political event of historical importance, but as theatrical. The entertainment industry as a whole is interested in the sensational. The subject matter of a news item is a sensational play characterized by marvelous stage facts. The stage sensation is then described in a newspaper in a sensational way. For in this sense, form perfectly matches content and also, indeed, what the content refers to. Sensational effects in a theatre are sensationally described by newspapers in a sensational manner. Now, the New York Herald hadn't always been so favorably disposed to sensation fiction, however, and I think we do need to remember that. We shouldn't just think that the Americans celebrated sensation and the British hated it. We shouldn't think that. The story, as always, is much more complicated. A few years later, the New York Herald had denounced sensation, and here it's very clear that it regards sensation as most decidedly bypassing our brains. Sensation novels, sensation sermons, and, note, sensation editors, not only seek to sustain the prejudices of particular audiences, especially women, but they even seek to fire the prejudices of one section of the country and set it against another. Now, I suggest you pause the video to read this passage as a whole to understand the gendering of sensation, and also how the term was often connected to violent misogyny and class prejudice. I won't comment any more on that because I think what I'm saying is very, very obvious. 
Whether the sensational bypasses our brains remains then an unresolved question. Perhaps the answer is not either yes or no, but both yes and no, or that it depends on individual cases. It's often claimed that sensational stories are intended to reinforce the prejudices of kinds of people we don't like. It's like propaganda in that respect. We tend to think that other people can't see through how sensational stories and propaganda manipulate us, though we believe we are fully conscious ourselves of how both of them work. In other words, we use the term sensational to dismiss other people and texts we don't agree with. But we can also use terms that we use violently like this to reflect in a non-violent manner on what they refer to and how such texts, so to called, operate. And this is what we'll do in the next video when we'll be focusing specifically on what sensation was in the entertainment industry at large. For the sensation novel didn't exist in a cultural vacuum, sealed off from everything around it. We'll even be taking seriously what's now one of the most infamous attacks upon sensation in our investigation. I look forward to seeing you then.